Good afternoon and welcome to the Chappaqua Library and the League of Women Voters program on the anniversary of the 19th Amendment presented by Attorney General Letitia James. I would like to start by thanking Jennifer Greer and Troy Outlaw from the Attorney General's office. Our moderator today is Sheila Burnson. Sheila Miller Burnson moved back from the metropolitan area in 2006 after having spent 25 years overseas in Turkey, South Korea, the Netherlands, and Lebanon. While overseas, she worked as a foreign legal consultant at Kim and Chang in Seoul and as a grants officer at the American University of Beirut. Since 2012, Sheila has been a volunteer attorney at Pace Women's Justice Center, representing victims of domestic violence. In 2019, Sheila was awarded the New York State Bar Association's President's Pro Bono Service Award for the Ninth Judicial District. Sheila serves on the boards of the League of Women Voters of Newcastle, the past co-president, and the League of Women Voters of New York State. In 2016, Sheila was awarded the Catherine Gerfin Writing uh, Fellowship at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence, where she continues to study writing. Sheila graduated from the Pace Law School, where she was a member of the Law Review and Sarah Lawrence College. I'm pleased to introduce New York State Attorney Letitia James. Uh, Letitia James is the current Attorney General for the state of New York becoming the first African-American and first woman to win the election as the 67th Attorney General of New York in 2018. Born in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, New York, Miss James graduated from the City University of New York's Lehman College, received her degree from Howard University School of Law in Washington, DC, and received her degree in the Master of Public Administration from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. As an attorney, activist, and public servant, Miss James has a long list of accomplishments. Ms. James has long focused on public service, first as a public defender for the Legal Aid Society, then serving on Mario Cuomo's task force on diversity in the judiciary, and is the assistant attorney general in charge of the Brooklyn Regional Office. During this time, Ms. James worked tirelessly to protect consumers from predatory home loans, civil rights abuses, and other un unlawful business practices. Ms. James has served as the New York City Council Member for the 35th District in Brooklyn before being elected as the New York City Public Advocate in 2013. Ms. James passed the Safe Housing Act, expanding and creating new recycling programs, and uncovered the Office of Payroll Administration's corrupt contract. As a public advocate, Ms. James' office handled over 32,000 complaints and passed legislation that bans questions on salary history, helping address the gender wage gap. As New York State Attorney General, Ms. James has fought to make sure that every person counts, challenging changes to the 2020 consensus. Ms. James has protected consumers from price gouging during the COVID-19 pandemic, work to ensure that the public's privacy rights are being upheld by the popular video conferencing softwares like Zoom, and currently demanding that New Yorkers be given access to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine when it becomes available. Thank you all. And Ms. James, uh, please. Thank you, Andrew. I just want to make a correction. Um, I did not graduate yet from Columbia. I'm still studying for that master's in public administration. I was a elected during that process, but thank you so much. Good afternoon and thank you to the Chappaqua Library and the League of Women Voters uh, for inviting me to join you. Special thank you to Sheila uh, Bernson and Ronnie Diamondstein and uh, Joan Kahn uh, uh, and Suzanne um, Kava uh, for inviting me here to speak with you today. We're here today to talk about and celebrate this uh, incredible milestone and that is the centennial of the 19th Amendment. This landmark legislation that granted women the right to vote uh, was far from perfect, but it was a vital step towards equality. I also wanna thank the Chappaqua Library. It reminds me of the days when I was young, when I would find myself um, in the Park Slope Library in Brooklyn, um, where I spent hours reading Grimm's fairy tales um, and uh, it was a place for me to find um, in those fairy tales a more perfect union, which is why I work each and every day to um, ensure that justice is served in the state of New York. Um, in celebration of this centennial, we must also um, reflect. And the reality is that the 19th Amendment only gave white women the right to vote. It wasn't until 50 years later that black women were granted this exact same right. And through this lens of history, we must also look forward and see 
whose rights still need protecting today. As I think about all of the children right now who have been removed from the arms of their families. Um, as I think about uh, the members of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and as I think about all of the individuals right now who are struggling from food insecurity and those who right now who are concerned about the possibility of being evicted from their homes. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and despite all of these uh, glaring gaps that are impeding the advancement of our society and of these communities as a whole um, and inhibiting the progress of our nation, uh, we need to recognize that uh, there is so much more work for all of us to do. And that's why it's so really critically important that we have conversations such as these, because I believe in working each and every day to, sure, to ensure that all communities have the right to thrive and to be full participants in our democracy. The League of Women Voters, um, you have a rich history of supporting women at the ballot box and that has spanned more than 100 years that it is still carrying out the mission it set out to do so long ago, fighting tirelessly to ensure that women are informed voters who all vote often and now in the state of New York, thank God we're voting early, but we still need have more to do in, in that arena. We all know that women are a strong political force. And this past year in one of the most important elections of our lifetime, we flexed our muscles and showed up in record numbers to stand up for issues such as health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, as you know, we, are de we defended in the United States Supreme Court. And just yesterday, we defended uh, the SALT deduction tax where we are limited to $10,000 um, and the administration um, is seeking, obviously, to continue um, that policy. Um, it's important that we also stand up for immigrant rights who are hiding in the shadow as we stood up for them, uh, again, to remove the citizenship question in the census. And a few weeks ago, we argued before the Supreme Court um, that undocumented immigrants be included um, in the census data um, so that we, they and we can have full representation and that resources um, not be limited by removing them um, from the enumeration. And the protection of our environment. It's an honor and a privilege to know that my office over these past four years has filed over 100 cases against this administration um, as a uh, um, they unfortunately have engaged in a pattern of um, uh, retrenchment. Um, and it's important that we stand up for the air that we breathe and the water that we all enjoy and the, and, uh, the land um, that we hope that our future generations can inherit. And because of all of the work um, of women and because we showed up at the polls in quiet dignity, we won. And when women show up, we win. It's as simple as that. When we all come together and we all recognize our, our common humanity as women. And as women, um, we recognize what's at stake. When we come together and set aside artificial differences, we win. But the battle, my friends, is, is um, far, far from over. Uh, we all know too well the right to vote, and we've all, over these last four months, recognized that our democracy is very, very fragile. We stand to lose what our farm foremothers worked so hard to gain if we do not safeguard the most precious and sacred right, which is fundamental to our democracy, and that is the right to vote. Uh, thank you. Uh, to everything your organization does to help those efforts and your advocacy against intentional barriers to the ballot, such as 
their reduction of hours for polling places, um, voter ID laws, voter purgers, purges, which even, believe it or not, happened in my beloved Brooklyn. In addition to the tireless work of grassroots actions to educate the public has produced valuable and necessary results across the nation. We have gone from fighting for the right to vote to fighting for the right to better access the ballot. Early voting and voting by mail are two ways that we can do that. In a, in a pandemic year, we had a record breaking early voting turnout. But wouldn't it be great if we can also have those drop off boxes as well in New York State? Um, we tried to work with the legislature to do just that. And unfortunately we were told that we could not do that. And we need to therefore um, reform our legislation so that we could have the right, uh, we could have drop off boxes in New York state. Watching people patiently waiting with quiet dignity and grace to participate and to use their hard fought fight right to have their voice heard was a huge win for the future of New York and the country. Individuals all across this country, no matter what efforts uh, were thrown in their way to deter them, uh, they stood online in repudiation of all of those efforts, hours on hours with their books and with some music um, and they voted anyway. And as for voting by mail, we saw states deny mail-in voting to those below a certain age, we saw lawsuits against other states to deny the, the use of secure ballot boxes. And my office actively engaged in lawsuits against the federal government for its efforts to dismantle the United States Postal Service just weeks before the election. We offered assistance to battleground states, legal assistance to battleground states. Um, these actions were nothing more, my friends, than modern day poll taxes, voter suppression tactics. And that's why my office fought back. We all have a responsibility to do our part to ensure that the right is protected and that we are active participants in moving our state and our country forward. I do it in honor of uh, the late John Lewis. I do it in honor of all of those who bled and died for that right to vote recognizing that it was essential and key to ensuring that uh, every part of um, our society exercises that basic franchise. What a privilege it is to represent a state that was home to the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls that eventually launched the entire suffrage movement. These early suffragists just spent years and even sometimes their entire lives advocating for this right to vote. And so it's appropriate um, and timely, particularly given what we've been through to take time out of our busy schedule um, and to recognize all that they have done for you and I. It was New York women who sparked this change and it is New York women who will continue to see it through when it is New York women who people all across this nation look to um, in support of and in defense of our democracy. And it is um, our honor and, and our duty to carry it on our shoulders. Um, but it's also an honor um, and to serve as the chief law enforcement officer in the state of New York, uh, to use the law both as a sword and as a shield. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions this afternoon. Hello, am I on? Yes, good afternoon. I have a few questions that um, have been submitted in advance of this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. James, for your talk, your moving talk on voting. Everyone and calls me Tish. Okay, Tish. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, the first question actually relates to voting. What are your thoughts about how the white suffragists made moral compromises by distancing themselves from black suffragists in order to win the support of the Southern legislators in their quest to win the right to vote? 
Was this strategy justified? Black women and other women of color did not acquire those legal protections until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. As I mentioned in my comments, we all know um, that the right to vote for black women came 50 years later. I think the point is, is that all of us need to come together at this point in our history. Um, and we need to put aside um, artificial barriers and we need to talk about our common struggles, particularly now when there are threats to our environment, threats to a woman's right to choose, which is very, very real, um, threats to immigrants, um, threats to low-income women, uh, threats to our health care and our system as a whole. And I think if the voices of Women United, um, if we uh, obviously had an impact on this election, if we come together as one, obviously we can have an impact on all of the issues that I just outlined. Okay, next question. New York has historically had low voter turnout compared to other states. Until 2020, New York State didn't have early voting as well as other voting reforms that have been introduced recently. What other measures that would promote voter access would you propose for New York? So there's been a number of proposals like same day registration. One of the proposals that I just mentioned is uh, that drop off box, making sure that it's secure in New York State. Um, that is really critically important. Um, and early voting was wonderful, but um, unfortunately, um, there weren't a um, sufficient number. In some places, we didn't have a sufficient number of uh, sites. And so we need to increase the number of sites. We saw the long lines in the early days of early voting on the first and second and third day. Um, it tapered off towards the end. Um, but what we really need, obviously, are more sites um, all throughout the state of New York. And we need to examine that going forward. Um, third question. From an enforcement perspective, how are our campaign finance laws faring? Is there enough transparency? And do we need better laws or better enforcement or both? Well, first, hopefully joining with this wonderful organization, we can repeal Citizens United. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I, I entered into politics um, with campaign finance. When I ran as a city council member, I was the first city council member um, to run on a third party line in some time in New York City. Um, and I did it because of uh, small donations. I did not have access to deep pockets. I did not have a famous name. Um, and I did not have access to um, uh, individuals and large law firms. All I had was my passion and my voice. And so through campaign finance, I was able to collect small contributions um, from individuals who have pink collars and in some cases, individuals with no collars who basically wanted um, someone who wanted to speak truth to power, but more importantly, someone who could address the issues that they cared about and issues reflecting the community that I served at the time. Um, so I believe in campaign finance. I believe in small contributions, um, but you're absolutely right. We obviously need more transparency. And when, as we go forward um, with campaign financing on a state level, uh, we need to make sure that there is more transparency and we need to make sure that there are agencies in place obviously to monitor um, accordingly and to um, not only monitor, but enforce uh, the laws accordingly. Okay, the next question, if the newly formed reapportionment commission produces maps that in the League of Women Voters opinion violate the spirit of the law, what role might you have as an attorney general? So we will be working obviously with civic organizations um, which represent a wide group of, um, of, or of um, uh, groups across the state of New York to ensure that the maps are fair um, and that their maps are consistent with the law. So we will be um, monitoring the reapportionment process, but prior to that, we wanna make sure that the data is correct. And obviously we are concerned uh, with respect to the argument that we argued before the United States Supreme Court um, uh, that this administration, the Trump administration, not exclude um, immigrants from the enumeration. That would obviously have an um, a adverse impact on New York State. There's a possibility we could lose maybe one or two congressional seats and lose funding for communities that need it the most. And so our focus at this point is really on the data. It was a good argument. I'm confident that we will win, 
Um, but as you know, there were a number of challenges to standing. There were also um, some issues that the case was not ripe. Um, and lastly, there were suggestions with respect to subcategories. Um, and so uh, if we were to lose on any of those um, issues, uh, obviously it would be a blow to New York State. Uh, I'm hoping um, that we will win the case, but in the event, if we are not successful, I'm hoping at worst, um, they just delay it uh, until uh, the data is submitted to the president. Okay, uh, this question, next question. Earlier this year, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the federal uh, Equal Rights Amendment, a proposed amendment to the constitution mm -hmm. that guarantees equal rights for women. Please explain your role in fighting to have the federal government recognize the Equal Rights Amendment as the 28th Amendment to the US Constitution and discuss the legal challenges that may prevent it from happening. So we joined with other um, attorney generals, most of them Democratic attorney generals in support of the amendment. As you know, um, some of my Republican colleagues and argued and some um, uh, uh, Republican elected officials argued that in fact it had, at the time had expired um, and um, uh, therefore uh, the entire process had to begin again. Um, we disagree with them um, and clearly that matter is currently being litigated in court. Um, and hopefully uh, we will go forward in recognizing that the Equal Amendment, um, we have sufficient states uh, to pass it. Uh, but again, there are some challenges. Um, here's, here's the final question that we, that we got in advance of your talk. How does the Equal Rights Amendment passed this year by the New York State to Senate differ from the federal ERA? And what is the process for adopting such an amendment to the New York State Constitution? Um, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember specifically um, what were the the differences at the moment, um, uh, um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but I um, let me get back to you and submit that answer to you at this point. But there were some differences with respect to the state as well as the federal. Um, but at this point in time, what we are proposing, uh, again, with our colleagues in, in, uh, in government, particularly the Democratic attorney generals, is that there's sufficient number of states have already passed it. It should be passed. But again, we're getting significant um, uh, blow black, blowback from our Republican colleagues that it was not timely um, and that the entire process has to begin again. Okay, I think, um, I think that's about it. Those are the questions that we had in advance that okay. were submitted. And um, there are questions in question and answer. I know. Okay. Um, Um, one question has to do with voting. It has to do with wh whether or not you think it'll ever be possible to vote by email, which would have been a real gift to those of us who stood in line for many hours to vote early. No, you're absolutely right. I wish we could vote online. Um, and there have been proposals and there are bills currently pending in the state legislature for that. Um, but there have been... Um, uh, criticism, not criticism, concerns with respect to um, privacy data um, and whether or not uh, um, it can be done in a manner which would, does not um, um, uh, um, impact the integrity of the vote. Uh, right. And so that struggle continues. As you know, right now, we, the Democrats control both um, houses in the state legislature. I don't know whether or not we're going to, whether or not that bill is on the agenda um, for this legislative session. This legislative session, I must say, will probably just be focused on rebuilding our economy, um, identifying revenue, um, and addressing the pandemic, um, and making sure um, that we engage in an equitable um, distribution of the uh, vaccine, um, and that we can all come out uh, from under a mask. Okay, here's a question that's come in live. Mm -hmm. um, you, it, it's direct, it actually it's asked of you personally saying that you've served as an outside, an outside role or outsized role, I think this was, it's a typo, 
yeah. at the national scale fighting against Trump policies? What are some of the red flags from your colleagues in other states that could impact civic engagement, voter access? What should we be vigilant about outside of gerrymandering? So, you know, at this point in time, you know, obviously um, I am in the crosshairs of, of the current administration. They've accused me of, on a, uh, accused me of politicizing the office. And as you know, the politics stops at the door. Um, all the investigations that we engage in are based on facts and based on evidence and an analysis of the law and primarily the, um, the, the, the one investigation which is ongoing, which will, which will be ongoing uh, uh, when the president is a citizen is our investigation into alleged financial improprieties as a result of the testimony of Michael Cohen. Um, and the facts we are alleging that in fact, he inflated his assets um, to acquire uh, loans and insurance cover coverage and then deflated his assets uh, for the purposes of evading and or avoiding tax liability. Um, going forward, what we are preparing, what we are doing is working on a list uh, with our colleagues, with our uh, colleagues across the country uh, to prepare a list for the Biden-Harris administration to reverse all of um, uh, the harms to New York State, um, such as census, DACA, SALT, state and local tax, um, environmental issues, um, and issues uh, uh, and, and harm to, to immigrants, um, educational um, issues, such as um, the fact that they have reduced nutritional standards in our schools, um, and the list goes on. And so what we are doing is compiling a list of all of the pending cases that need to mm. be stayed, all of the regulation that needs to be reversed, um, and some legislative loopholes that need to be closed. Um, and we are submitting that to the legislature. They include obviously some consumer harms, some issues um, affecting predatory lenders that we are seeing post, um, that we were seeing um, in the midst of the pandemic and we are concerned about post COVID. Um, so those issues and more, it's a very comprehensive list that we are submitting to um, the Biden-Harris administration at the same time. Um, we, um, again, are concerned, obviously, about the vaccine and the vaccination and making sure um, that there is a priority list um, and the distribution, um, obviously, uh, distribution will include communities um, that have um, uh, been ignored and or communities that do not have a chain pharmacy um, and, and uh, communities that have been greatly impacted um, by COVID-19. Uh, we have one final question yeah. and it's related again to COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the, some primary issues that you have seen during COVID facing, I guess, facing our population? So um, during COVID, we have dealt with over 8,000 complaints um, to our hotline. They primarily relate um, to price gouging um, issues um, that have been uh, brought to our attention or complaints that have been brought to our attention um, by um, workers um, uh, in certain industries where um, certain protocols uh, were not being um, adhered to. Um, we have also um, been dealing a lot with self-help evictions uh, huh. We have also uh, been dealing with women who are victims of domestic violence um, hmm. and unfortunately have nowhere to turn to um, because um, they are quarantined. Uh, we have been dealing with individual and in public housing who cannot quarantine in small quarters, small rooms, and obviously um, need uh, to be, uh, need access um, uh, to larger quarters and we've been working uh, primarily with the city and the government um, to provide them uh, with some uh, assistance so that they can reloc relocate temporarily to hotels. Um, and we have been dealing a lot with um, children in communities who do not have access to the internet and are not learning remotely um, because their homes their public housing where they live are not wired and they, they do not have the hard um, um, skills and or um, soft skills 
um, to get on the internet um, in order to learn virtually. Those are just some of the issues we've been dealing with, but a lot of it has to do with price gouging um, and a lot of it um, has to do with individuals um, who unfortunately are taking advantage of senior citizens and other vulnerable populations that are socially isolated, who are preying upon them, who are calling with these stupid robocalls, uh, asking them to donate to um, all, types, all types of charities that do not exist mm. um, and or charities that do exist, where, but these individuals are keeping 99% of the money. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, ca calls that they are getting uh, basically saying that um, they've got stimulus checks um, and, um, and gaining into these individuals, these bottom feeders have been gaining access to their, their uh, personal data. That's what we've been dealing with. Okay, this is the last question. They keep said coming that three in. three times, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last, last question. It's a very general question. And more than one person has been asking this question. So I thank you so much for your time, but we want one more minute out of you. It's good. <laughs> what do you think is the most significant challenge facing New York? How will your office address it? And how can the community best become engaged? Oh, there's so many issues I right know. now. There's a backlog of eviction proceedings. Um, I'm concerned about when we lift um, the ban on evictions. I'm concerned about foreclosures. I'm concerned about the food, um, uh, the fact that there is food insecurity. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the lines that I'm seeing at food pantries and people trying to seek assistance. I'm concerned about the economic, um, uh, uh, economic insecurity, the high unemployment rates. Um, I'm concerned about immigrants hiding in the shadow of government. Um, concerned about victims of domestic violence who feel that they've got nowhere to turn and they're staying with their batterer. Um, I'm concerned um, uh, about, uh, um, the, again, the number of children who do not have access and are not learning virtually. That being said, what can you do? You can volunteer um, to teach a, teach a child, to tutor a child. Um, you could um, be more like Ms. Burnson, Ms. Burnson and help women get divorces um, or, or get away from their batterers, find them safe escapes, um, um, uh, safe harbors. Uh, we can urge our government, particularly our United States Senate to pass um, this um, stimulus package, this $900 billion package, which is currently on their desk. Senator McConnell has got to work with Nancy Pelosi. We've got to pass something before the holidays. Email, text, do something. Um, our Senate um, representatives are fine, but reach out to Mitch McConnell and uh, those red states. Um, write letters, start a campaign. Um, uh, um, we could, um, again, work with our legislature, um, uh, again, to protect consumers uh, against abusive behavior, particularly in the uh, predatory mortgage space. We've got to strengthen our laws um, to provide more authority to my office so that I can go after these predatory lenders. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm glad and I want to applaud the governor of the state of New York for offering assistance to tenants because um, tenants are having a difficult time paying their rent and homeowners, some homeowners paying their mortgages. Um, uh, and so I'm glad that he provided some assistance yesterday and reduced the red tape. And last but not least, we need an infrastructure bill to put people back to work. That's what we really need to do to rebuild our roads and our bridges um, and to build out the internet so that we can provide um, internet access uh, to all of those children and those homes that I mentioned before, uh, because the, um, 
there is a there is definitely a digital divide in our society. Individuals are talking about 5G. There are some communities that don't have any G. Um, so we need to, again, do more. But I know this organization will do all that they can. And I know that you will join me in, again, um, pushing for greater access to the ballot uh, uh, and to the franchise, um, joining with me um, as we turn to Georgia um, to make sure that, that uh, we remove any barriers to the ballot and these upcoming elections, these two upcoming Senate elections, which are obviously really critical in our, to our nation. Um, um, and those are just some of the issues. And that we, again, support and raise funds uh, for community-based organizations right now that are struggling, um, particularly community-based organizations to help immigrant families um, that, that, are, uh, that are absolutely key. Um, so those are just some of those issues. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Attorney General uh, Ms. James, uh, Sheila Bernson from the League of Women Voters, uh, the League of Women Voters for co-sponsoring this program, and all of our attendees who have come to, to see this today. So thank you all very much. I, it's been an honor to have you, Ms. James. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everyone have a good day. Thank you.